Hi guys, welcome to today's MCQ discussion, MCQ discussion number 18. So let's get started. So the first question for today, in which of the following does the HMP shunt pathway take place? A. Nucleus, B. Cytoplasm, C. Mitochondria, or D. Both A and B. So pause, think, and then we will discuss. So the question here is essentially, where does the HMP shunt pathway take place? So let's talk a little bit about the HMP shunt pathway because it's fairly high yield. So the HMP shunt pathway is also called the pentose phosphate pathway. And the main goal or the aim of this pathway is to generate NADPH, okay? So now let's talk a little bit about the pathway. So the pathway starts with glucose 6-phosphate which comes from glycolysis. So it's a byproduct of glycolysis. So if you remember, in glycolysis, the first step of glycolysis was where glucose was converted to glucose 6-phosphate. And then it is this glucose 6-phosphate which is directed into the HMP shunt pathway and it's the first step or the substrate of the HMP shunt pathway. So the first step, this glucose 6-phosphate is dehydrogenated by an enzyme called glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase to form 6-phosphogluconolactone. So glucose 6-phosphate is dehydrogenated by an enzyme called G6PD or glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase to form 6-phosphogluconolactone which is then converted to 6-phosphogluconate by an enzyme called gluconolactonase which is then again converted to ribulose 5-phosphate by 6-phosphogluconate dehydrogenase. So, from a neat point of view, only the first step of this reaction is important, okay? So, whenever you're studying reactions and cycles for NEAT, try and focus on the rate-limiting steps and the key steps and don't you don't need to know the whole cycle. Definitely for first years and for those giving the biochemistry exam, this the whole cycle is important. But from the NEAT point of view, it's only the key steps or the rate-limiting steps that matter. So the important step here is the dehydrogenation of glucose 6-phosphate to give rise to 6-phosphogluconolactone by the enzyme G6PD, which is also the rate-limiting enzyme of this reaction. And it is this reaction that gives rise to NADPH from the NAD plus. NADP plus. So I told you the main goal of the HMP shunt pathway is to generate NADPH. And why is this NADPH important? Because this NADPH later is plays an important role in the reduction of glutathione, okay, fatty acid synthesis and cholesterol synthesis. So NADPH is later directed or the NADPH formed in the HMP shunt pathway is later directed for glutathione reduction, fatty acid synthesis and cholesterol synthesis. And that was the main goal or aim of this pathway. A few more points you should know about every pathway. Firstly, and most importantly, where the pathway happens, whether it's in the mitochondria, whether it's in the nucleus or the cytoplasm. So the HMP shunt pathway happens only in the cytoplasm of the cell. So it occurs only in the cytoplasm of the cell because the enzymes associated, particularly the G6PD, is found only in the cytoplasm of the cell. So the HMP shunt pathway occurs in the cytoplasm of the cell and it's commonly seen in hepatic cells, mammary cells and the adrenal cortex. So you can remember it with the mnemonic HMP, hepatic cells, mammary cells or the gl mammary gland cells and the periphery of the adrenal cortex or the, uh, sorry, per per periphery of the adrenal gland, which is the adrenal cortex. So it's seen in only these cells. So most importantly, it occurs in the cytosol. So the answer in this question or the answer to this question was P cytoplasm because G6PD is only present in the cytoplasm. Now, let's, so whenever you approach any cycle in biochemistry or any uh, pathway in biochemistry, I would recommend remembering only things under these four headings. You, you, should, you really don't need to study the whole cycle because it's really a waste of time and you will end up forgetting it. So you should try and make this kind of review sheets for every cycle. So biochemistry was my weakest subject. So I would spend a lot of time uh, finding out what's important. So I found that they rarely ask the intermediate steps. They only focus on the rate limiting steps. So for every reaction, you should know about the substrate and the product. So the first step and the last step. So talking about the HMP shunt, here you had 
G6P or glucose 6 phosphate, which came from glycolysis as the substrate. And finally, you ended up with two things NADPH and ribulose 5 phosphate. And what was the goal of this pathway? To again generate NADPH, and you should know where the site is. So it occurs in the cytoplasm. And lastly, you should know about the key steps and the rate limiting step. So here, the rate limiting step was G6P to 6 phosphogluconolactone under the influence of G6PD, glucose 6 phosphate dehydrogenase. And this was the step which also generated NADPH. So for every cycle or every pathway, I would recommend you study it in this way. Know about the substrate, know about the product, know about the goal of the pathway, know about the site where it occurs, either nucleus, cytoplasm, mitochondria, or all or both. And lastly, know about the key steps and the rate limiting steps of the pathway. It's very difficult to remember the whole pathway. Now let's move to the second question of the day. Which of the following structures do not pass through the aortic opening of the diaphragm? So which, fall, which of the structures do not pass through the ionic, aortic opening of the diaphragm? A. Aorta, B. Azygous vein, C. Thoracic duct or D. Vagal trunk. So pause, think and then we'll discuss. So again, so you know that the diaphragm has three major openings, right? Firstly, you have the inferior vena cava opening or the cava opening, which is at the level of T8. Then you have the esophageal opening at the level of T10. And lastly, you have the aortic opening, which is at the level of T12. Okay, so those were the three major openings as I showed in the diagram. Let's talk a little bit about the openings and the structures that pass through them. And then we'll come back and answer. So the diaphragm has three major openings as we discussed the inferior vena cava opening at level of T8, esophageal opening at the level of T10 and aortic opening at the level of T12. I already showed you on the diagram. So the IVC opening is located in the central tendon of the diaphragm. Okay, it's this opening is present or openings are also called hiatus. Okay, so this hiatus is present within the central tendon of the diaphragm and the structures that pass through it include the inferior vena cava and the right phrenic nerve. Then you have the esophageal opening, little lower at the level of T10 and it, this is present in the muscular part of the diaphragm and the structures that pass through it include the esophagus and the right and left vagus nerve. Then you have the aortic opening which lies between the two crusts of the diaphragm and here you have the aorta, the thoracic duct, azygous and hemiazygous vein. So the aorta, thoracic duct, azygous and hemiazygous vein pass through the aortic opening. Now let's look at a picture for a better understanding and so that you never forget. So here you have the, in the brown, you have the muscular part of the diaphragm. You have the tendinous part of the diaphragm or the central tendon of the diaphragm. And then you have the crust of the diaphragm. This is the right crust and this is the left crust of the diaphragm. So I told you the inferior vena cava opening is present within the central tendon, right? And through this, you have the inferior vena cava, it's also called the caval opening or caval hiatus. So in this you have the inferior vena cava and the right phrenic nerve on the central tendon. Then in the muscular part, okay, in the muscular part, you have the esophageal hiatus, which through which the esophagus and both right and left vagal nerve pass through. And lastly, between the two crusts of the diaphragm, okay, you have the aortic opening through which the aorta, aorta, azygous vein, hemiazygous vein and thoracic duct pass through. So you have an artery vein and artery, two veins and also lymphatic. So aorta, azygous vein, hemiazygous vein and thoracic duct. So this hiatus of the diaphragm are of very, very high yield topic. So you should know this well. So make sure you revise this. So there are also three minor openings, three minor openings. We spoke about the three major openings, but the aorta also has three minor openings. So firstly, you have something called the space of Larry or the costoziphoid gap. So there's a small gap here through which your superior epigastric artery passes. So the costoziphoid gap through which the superior epi epigastric artery passes. Then you have two ligaments. Sorry for erasing that. Yeah. So you have a lateral arcuate ligament and a medial arcuate ligament as shown in the diagram. So through the medial arcuate ligament, you have a sympathetic chain that passes through and through the la lateral arcuate ligament, which is another minor opening, you have the subcostal vessels and nerves that pass through. So those were about the major openings and their contents. 
little bit about the minor this is not high yield but the major openings are very high yield so you should know them and you should be able to identify them can be asked in various ways now let's move to the last question for today which of the following amino acids does not absorb uv light a alanine b phenylalanine c tyrosine or d tryptophan so another biochemistry question so pause think and then we will discuss so the answer here is fairly obvious it's a alanine okay so a alanine so before i proceed with this question the la this question i forgot to tell you the answer so the answer was d vagal trunk aorta passes through the aortic opening the zygous vein passes through the aortic opening the thoracic duct passes through the aortic opening but the vagal trunk passes through the esophageal hiatus okay so it passes through the esophageal hiatus so both right and left vagus pass through the esophageal hiatus so that the answer here was d okay so sorry for that now we'll go back to the question yeah here's the answer was a alanine so remember it is the aromatic amino acids that absorb uv light so uv light is in a spectrum of 24 to 250 to 290 nanometers and it is the aromatic amino acids or the aromatic structure of amino acids that allow it to absorb uv light and there are three important you know aromatic amino acids you have tryptophan phenylalanine and tyrosine or ptt you can remember that so tryptophan tyrosine and phenylalanine are the aromatic amino acids and therefore they will absorb uv light the question is which does not absorb alanine is not aromatic therefore it does not absorb uv light so again another previous year question so another way to approach such a question suppose you don't know about it you know that phenylalanine to tyrosine and tryptophan are all in the same group right they are all in the same group and they are all aromatic amino acids right so you should know all the different sulfur containing amino acids aromatic amino acids so classification of amino acids very very important so most of us know that phenylalanine tyrosine and tryptophan are 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 aromatic amino acids and therefore most of their properties especially something like absorbing of uv light would be similar so all aromatic amino acids have some similar properties so if you ever get a question like this and you see these three as an option mostly since they come together it should be the fourth option that would be the answer so these three always come together so you could rule them out so if phenylalanine comes definitely tyrosine should come you know so those two always come together and most probably tryptophan would also be part of that group so therefore even if you didn't know that um, aromatic amino acids absorb uv light you know that these three come together so this is a stand out so this could be the answer so again this is not the ideal way of answering but there are different ways of answering the question and i usually uh, many a times used to answer like this even when i didn't know the fact so again aromatic amino acids contain a aromatic ring and therefore absorb uv light of 250 to 290 nanometers so that's it for today's discussion short discussion but three high yield topics have been discussed so all the best and see you guys in the next discussion